Welcome back to the Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity Podcast. If you are new to the podcast, the Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity Podcast is all about optimizing the health of the ageless athlete. So whether it's optimizing your fitness, nutrition, or wellness practices, this podcast is for you. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest podcasts. In today's episode, my special guest is Esther Blum. Esther is an integrative dietitian who works with ageless athletes to optimize their health through nutrition and wellness practices. Specifically, she works with gut health, stress management, and nutrition to combine a prescription that is going to get you feeling better and performing better as well. There are tons of topics that we discussed in today's podcast, including how the paradigm has shifted in this post pandemic world in terms of the health of the ageless athlete, how pre and post menopausal women should be addressing their fitness and nutrition in a whole new way. And then Esther and I get to talk about how men could be the greatest ally for the post menopausal woman. If you like today's podcast, make sure you subscribe, rate, review, share with a friend and enjoy this episode featuring Esther Blum. Esther, where does this podcast find you? Hey there. I'm in Weston, Connecticut. Weston, Connecticut. Look at you in Fairfield County. Is that Fairfield County? <laughs> Are you from the area originally? Um, so I am originally from Bedford, which is over over the, across yeah. the line there. But yeah. uh, my parents right now are in, are in Norwalk. Uh, in Sona. Oh my gosh, a stone's throw away. Exactly. Yeah. So small world. Now, uh, small world. how did you end up in Weston? Well, uh, you know, I was in New York City for a good 16 years and my husband landed a job at um, a hedge fund in Norwalk, actually. And uh, after eight beautiful years there, it closed. So now he, he was commuting back to New York City, but thanks to COVID, he's working at home and it is like the best thing. We're all so happy to have him home again. So yeah, we moved up here and then life moved him back to the city, but it's it's really a great place to live. It's really beautiful. Tons of nature. We're off the grid. We got well water and a generator Whoa. and bears that... and snakes <laughs> and coyotes and foxes. And it's it's really a special place to connect with nature. That's a very uh, impressive thing that you're doing now. And it's a great segue into something that uh, I think is very apparent in the last two years, this uh, migration of people out of the city, uh, may maybe working from home a little bit more. But I imagine that there is a whole host of other issues that start to come up for individuals now that we're shifting into this work from home atmosphere. As a um, practitioner who works with individuals uh, in that type of uh of range there in terms of, you know, that's the, those who are out of the office now and working mostly from home. What have you seen as some of the, uh, effects of this work from home, like shift? Yeah. Well, on the positive side, right. Uh, I've seen a lot more people spending time with family. People are cooking more. I can tell you like my, uh, my husband and son are obsessed with like, YouTube cooking videos. We bought, <laughs> they bought like carbon steel cookware, which I had never, I'm like, oh, I was wow. like trying to figure out. I stink. I cannot figure out seasoning cast iron pans. We have tried and tried. <laughs> I can't cook eggs on them. Like it just takes forever. Right. So enter, you know, carbon steel cookware, much easier than cast iron and really uh, safe and healthy, like no off gassing of chemicals and the nonstick stuff. So definitely more cooking um, and I've seen people, you know, hopefully spending more time in nature. What has been difficult is people are walking by their kitchen every five minutes uh. and thinking that they need to actually eat every five minutes and definitely a lot, a lot, a lot of booze intake and people <laughs> aren't going to gyms and don't necessarily have, you know, uh, a full gym at home, which you actually don't even need. But, you know, I've definitely- Can you talk more about of, that? Yes. Okay. So there is this really cool search channel, people. I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's called YouTube. <laughs> and they have like a bazillion videos that you can do for workouts at home with no equipment at all, just your body weight even. 
Um, so you don't actually need a gym. Yes, of course, I want to see people lifting and doing strength training, but you know, you do five minutes of walking lunges, your legs are going to be pretty darn sore and fit. Uh, so, you know, you, you can make do. And now I think you can actually get a hold of weights again online. I know they're sold out for a while or bands or, you know, a TRX, something simple or, you know, one or two kettlebells. And really all you need is, I mean, our loft, we have a loft in our house, um, it's about 100 square feet and that's all we need to work out just has a weight bench and weights and a mirror <laughs> and that's pretty much and some bands that's all we use so it can be super simple so what are you seeing the biggest hurdles as you work with individuals in terms of getting a consistent exercise routine going accountability is a big problem and um the other thing I should mention, though, is that, you know, a, there's a ton of virtual training out there, too. A lot of amazing strength coaches that I refer to who work with people virtually. Um, so not having accountability. And listen, I have accountability. I have a strength coach I work with. Like, I pay money because I will walk. Like, I get out the door. I walk every day, at least an hour in the morning. If And then more in the afternoon. I have a dog. It's like, not even negotiable. I don't enjoy lifting weights, even though I enjoy after mm -hmm. just getting my ass up to the loft is like, oh God, I don't feel like it. But then when I'm done, I'm like, woo, I'm a rock star. So even I need the accountability. So if you can't, uh, you know, hire, if you don't have the means financially or you lost your job in COVID, just get with a friend and get an accountability partner and be like, okay. These are the days I'm going to work out. Um, I have clients lay their clothes out the night before, and this is what I personally do. It's, I started doing it. I ran a marathon and had to get up really early to train because my job didn't afford me the luxury of long runs before I went to work. So I would get up, you know, 5, 5.15, and uh, I would lay my clothes out the night before. <clears throat> That's really important. Number two is scheduling it in your calendar the way you do any other meeting, right? So you pick the days. If you want to be Tuesday, Thursdays, you want to Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday to do your strength training. I have my set days and I try not to deviate from those days. My workout, my lifting days are Tuesday, Thursday, and Sundays. Sometimes I move them when I travel, um, but I try to just make sure there's a gym you know, when I'm traveling, not that I'm traveling much anymore. I was going to say now that we're not traveling quite as much, it's almost like, uh, yeah. you know, that's more of, like you said, uh, taking some of those tips, you said, uh, laying your clothes out the night before and yeah. also like actually physically putting it into your calendar workout at this time. Any other like yeah. golden nuggets that you can share with us that not only have you utilized, but the clients that yeah. you worked with utilized? Yeah, well, it's also, you know, going to bed early enough the night before. I mean, these are really simple things, but the biggest lifestyle shifts, uh, the simplest ones, I should say, are the hardest ones to change, but make the biggest impact. And I could tell you, the clients I treat with the biggest weight issues are going to bed sometime after midnight and usually around two in the morning. And I did see people, this was the other big shift I saw during COVID is, People had kids home, right? We all had to adapt and help our kids do online learning because that's a big, I mean, geez, I didn't have the, I don't know if I would have had the executive function to do it, let alone any child with, a, you know, who, who's struggling. And then you add on like any learning challenges or executive functioning issues. That's a huge challenge. So parents adapted to support their kids. However, then they weren't starting their work day until much later. And as a result, they gained a lot of weight um, during well, COVID. Let's be more worked. let's be more precise in that. Moms were taking care of these things. Mm. You know, I think I think uh, the, the data is showing that moms are disproportionately affected by this this pandemic. So, is that consistent with sure. your seeing as well? Yeah, and the booze intake also. <laughs> let's get into it. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> the booze intake has skyrocketed for so many moms in particular. And, you know, it's really normalized for women and moms in particular to like go and drink. Like it's wine o'clock. And, you know, I, listen, I, I wrote a whole chapter on hangover recovery in my book, Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous. I was quite the party girl in my 20s and even 30s. But 
in time, it really messes with your energy. It certainly is not going to help you lose any fat. Even one drink per week can really mess up your fat loss goals. And it makes you far more irritable. Like if you're having PMS, that's really bad. Check your alcohol intake. And if you're on hormone replacement, also, it, it's not a good idea. It will raise your circulating estrogen levels for as long as your blood alcohol content's elevated. So we have to, as much as it's really tempting to want to drink and numb ourselves, we have to reprogram ourselves and think of other ways to relax and unwind. That's not just booze. So I Such as? Of, <laughs> Okay, perfect. Yogi bedtime tea, you or chamomile, you brew three bags of that in one mug. It's like a natural Xanax, okay? It totally mellows you out. Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, some people use CBD products um, to mellow themselves out and swear by that, but I, I prefer the more natural things. I love passion flower, which um, really quiets a ruminating mind. I use a lot of homeopathy myself. Um, I use aconite and arsenic, and those are great for kind of acute anxiety and stress and palpitations. Um, those deep breathing baths. And honestly, the biggest, to me, the biggest stress management is just quiet. Is mm. <laughs> quiet. We spent, we had a, a wedding this past weekend in Vermont. We had to drive up with family in the car for five hours. I was like, we got home. I was like, I don't want to talk to you. There's not enough yogi anybody. tea in, in Connecticut. To, in the world. To, to, to. Yeah, I just like, I put on Netflix show for half an hour and just was like, don't. My son kept coming in the room. I was like, don't talk to me. Just don't talk to me. I'll be nice tomorrow. But <laughs> And I just got a really good night's sleep and was like, okay, I'm back. And, and like went for a hour and a half walk all the way to this gorgeous reservoir near us and just stood by the water. I was like, quiet. I just need quiet. So I really had to go through like an emotional detox. I love my family, but too much of anybody. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're working with clients and, and, uh, to, to, you know, I ask you this first, um, how does an integrative it's an integrative dietitian is is your is your professional name right how does that yeah. differ from let's say an a, a, an rd that you might see from the yellow pages i might date myself in saying that the yellow pages listen <laughs> honey we were in the white pages so. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so i am trained as um a registered dietitian i practiced in hospitals for 5 years so registered dietitian Right, you've got basically a pre-med degree with slightly less chemistry and no physics, which is why I went into it actually, because I <laughs> I really like science, but I really hated physics. And I was like, nope, nope, I'm not gonna be a physical therapist, I'm not gonna be a doctor, but I could be a dietitian. Mm -hmm. So the curriculum that you're taught, it's like the American, it's the parallel equivalent to the American Medical Association where the recommendations are outdated or don't, it's like everything has to be supported by these clinical studies that are often sponsored by like the Dietetic Association. I don't know if it still is, but for years was sponsored by a company you may know called Coca-Cola mm -hmm. and, you know, Nestle and all these big companies. And my dietitian journal, I get two different, two, probably two to four different journals, but the uh, clinical dietitian journal, it's sponsored by all the ads are canola oil, soybean oil. It's like big ag, right? And everything in moderation. I'm like, nope, that's actually not great, even in moderation. Then my functional medicine journals are like, here are the benefits of borage oil on hot flashes or vaginal dryness, or, you know, it's really um, much more holistic applications of diet and supplements, which as a dietitian, you really don't learn about supplements. And you're taught as a dietitian not to sell them, not to make money from supplements. So already you're not servicing people. And when I went and got my functional medicine degree, I was handed a binder this thick of studies that I had 
never seen before, didn't even know existed on the benefits of nutrients and supplements and um, even protein guidelines, right? Were so different. And I was so angry. I was like, where is, why wasn't this information presented to us? Because the studies are valid. They're not sponsored by big ag. They're just scientific studies in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So it's fascinating to me that there's such a divide. Um, but with regards, I, I want to revisit the protein requirements as well. I mean, when you are trained as a hospital dietitian or getting your degree as an undergrad, and even in graduate school, because I do have a master's in clinical nutrition too, you learn that the body, the protein requirements are 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram uh, of, of dietary protein. That is what I pretty much gave to my patients in renal failure, waiting mm. for dialysis. Like, and yet you're supposed to build muscle on that or support a baby, uh, growing a baby, a human life on that or the aging body. And the research now shows that, you know, as we age, we actually need more protein to maintain skeletal muscle, to prevent Alzheimer's, AKA type three diabetes. Uh, we need it to balance blood sugar. We need it for adrenal function. Um, and so I'm hoping that the clinical, that the dietitian curriculum catches up to that at some point, but there's still a huge gap between the two. So as a patient working with you, what is the biggest thing that you're gonna see that's different from working with a conventional registered dietitian? Well, I do a lot of functional medicine testing. So I look at blood, I look at stool, and I look at urine. And I do a complete panel with blood work from thyroid to inflammatory markers to insulin and blood sugar management to thyroid antibodies, autoimmune antibodies. Um, and then I will do a Dutch test, which is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, and that really tracks your hormone production, your detoxification, your cortisol levels, your adrenal function, and the neurotransmitters in your brain. And then I look at stool tests, uh, the GI map in particular, because that tells me whether or not you're recirculating your estrogen in your gut, if you're detoxing it properly, it tells me if you have pathogens, it tells me if you have uh, leaky gut, it tells me if you have inflammation. So I certainly didn't learn that when I was a dietitian. You don't learn about anything other than the basic blood work guidelines, which really haven't been updated since 1929. So the functional medicine guidelines are a bit different. So... Working with you, you're obviously going to have a lot more diagnostic information. It's, you know, it's not just a traditional blood panel where you're going, oh, here's your LDL, here's your HDL and stop eating yeah. fat. Uh, <laughs> so so <laughs> what, what would a potential intervention look like and what is the most common mm -hmm. maladies that you see in the co cohort that I work mostly with, which is considered the ageless athlete? We're talking the 40 plus individual who... Mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't, you know, fall too far on one side of the spectrum or the other, kind of sitting in that middle, maybe a little bit of uh, excess body fat, maybe a few drinks every week, very career oriented, career driven, you know, that 2.5 kids uh, with the white picket fence type of person. What do you see in most common with them as you look at their, uh, you know, their, their blood panels and their urine and their poo? Very poor stress management, okay. um, too much caffeine and booze, not enough sleep. And, and you can see that in their poo? Much, what's that? And you can see that like just looking at their, their urine, their stool, their, their, their hormone profiles, that kind of stuff. Like, you yeah, know, before you even ask them. Well, I, I have everyone get tested before I even work with them. So I oh, get that wow. information. So the first. numbers don't lie. You're like, you can tell me anything you want, but if I'm looking at all this stuff, you can spin me any yarn you want. I can see it right in front of me. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. I mean, my doctor laughed, like I had an appointment with him. I work with a functional medicine doctor and he was like, you know, your inflammatory markers are ridiculously low. Like you actually do what you say you do. And we burst out laughing because most people are like, 
most people don't. I mean, I, I had a client last week who was like, I walked every day. I said, great. How, how long did you walk for? Five minutes. I'm not even king. So I said, so you, you walked like maybe a quarter mile every day. That's right. I said, okay, well now, you know, so yeah. perception or they'll say, I eat really healthy this week. But then I look at their food logs and I'm like, well, actually you didn't. So we either need to educate you on Milano cookies or you're in complete denial. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we, we laugh together, but I'm like, dude, come on. Like, you know, this stuff, but, but some people really need reinforcement. Some people are very slow to grasp new concepts. And some people just don't want to give up a lifetime of, you know, comfort eating. So, but in your case, right. For the people who are probably listening to this, the, the forties, um, you know, some of the greatest things you can do just if you're going to start with one place, right, I would start with sleep. And this is kind of a little, um, it, it actually is two places, but because if you are not sleeping enough, right, first of all, your blood sugar handling is going to be much poorer. Um, you're going to develop that nice muffin top that eventually will hit turn into a cake top. I loved when you, I've heard you use that before. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal that ah, from you there, Esther. <laughs> it's a good visual, right? Yep. It's a very good visual. Um, but also you're going to have a lot of brain fog. You're going to be irritable. You're not going to perform as well at your job. Your libido is going to go down and certainly your endurance is going to go down. And so a couple of ways to do that is one, you want to modulate your caffeine intake for a lot of people I treat, even one cup of coffee, like really disrupts their sleep, makes them get up to pee, then they can't fall back asleep. Um, and so I use a product and recommend it. I have no financial ties, but it's a product called by Four Sigmatic. It's called Perform, oh, yeah. which is great for endurance, right? And it's cacao and reishi mushrooms are great for mental focus. So if you want that like feeling of alertness, uh, that's a good thing to have instead of coffee because you get no irritability and no crash and your sleep will be much better. Um, but the other thing is too, if you are exercising really hard and doing long duration cardio, you might have to change your training and really go for more um, rest-based runs where you're you know, walking for five minutes and sprinting for one minute um, or just switch to walking or you know, power yoga um, and, and lifting weights. Like the body is not so resilient in the forties. And especially once you hit menopause, the adrenals are doing their best to kind of sputter out that last leg of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So there isn't a lot of bandwidth left to do these really high intensity uh, workouts. And unless you're genetically gifted, you know, you see plain people older doing Ironmans and such. So you really have to listen to your body. For sure. And I think we, we overestimate <laughs> <laughs> what our bodies can do. Be like, oh, I'm a genetic freak. I, I, have, I work off four hours of sleep and I'm perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, what is the cold yeah. slap in the face that you give to clients that you work with that wake them up to this, to, to, to the reality that they're, they've, they've, they've bought into their own bullshit for too long? <laughs> well, first of all, as we mentioned, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. So, you know, when I see someone who is like literally on the verge of a heart attack, mm. I, I don't have to slap them too hard. They're, <laughs> it's more of a they're gentle already graze. <laughs> in the know, but yet a lot of people are still in denial. So yeah. then um, I get a little sneakier and I have them slap on a continuous glucose monitor. Oh, nice. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm hardcore on the data and there's like no escaping. You know, my, I have some clients that really struggle with accountability and every day I'm up on their DMs being like, show me your logs, show me your logs, where are your numbers? And so some people like that, some people don't, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not paid to make friends. I'm paid to get results. And I always say, I lovingly kick people's ass. I'm compassionate, but I will absolutely call you out on your bullshit. If you're, so. <laughs> That's what they well, pay you for though. <laughs> they pay me for, so you may not like me, but you'll love me when you're fitting into your clothes and, 
and getting your libido back and sleeping and your mood is better and your energy is better and your joints aren't achy and you know, you're not hot flashing anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but the reality is, you know, I would say 70 to 8% of people who come to me really do follow what I tell them to, because they are so desperate and understandably so to feel better. You know, it, I think a lot of people have been gaslit by the medical industry for so long and dismissed. And when they find someone who's seriously going to listen to everything and unpack and unearth every little symptom and frustration and problem that they're having, they feel really heard. And of course, we've all been, right? We've all been dismissed or told ads ah, in your head, right? I remember one doctor, I had like really bad insomnia at one point, and he gave me a copy of the Kabbalah and told me to put it under my pillow. I was like, are you kidding me? Like this was, it was really insulting, but like <laughs> makes for a great story, but you're like, you have got to be kidding me. So, you know, people, when they come to me are on their last leg, or they've been to five to 10 different doctors and still haven't really received the right medical care or, and I'm not saying I'm the end all be all either. I often will bring in the help of a functional medicine doctor because I don't cover, for example, like treatment for mold or Lyme. So I need help, but I can at least say, you know, this really sounds like X, let's pull in a doctor and run some more tests. So when, when people find that support um, and camaraderie and encouragement and uh, you know, spiritual, physical, emotional support. They really do. Most people really are good about listening because they're just, I can tell, I also have a screening process. I don't let everybody in my practice either. So if someone's not a fit, I will absolutely say, you know, maybe come back to me a later date, but right now, uh, you know, I won't be a fit for you because I'll be so far up your grill. You won't enjoy any of this. And I certainly won't enjoy it either. So I love that. It's be the right fit. For sure. So obviously for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women, uh, you probably have some recommendations in terms of how they need to shift their diet and also their exercise regimen. What would those look like? Yeah, a lot gentler and simpler. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, caffeine and booze, most women, when they really cut those down, start sleeping better immediately. Um, I put them on a on a blue light diet as well. Um, and that means at night getting off the devices. My favorite time of the day is when I shut my phone off by eight o'clock at night. Yeah. That is nothing, people, listen up. Nothing good comes from checking anything after 8 p.m. Unless it's a work issue or, you know, you have a family member with medical needs, okay. But don't sleep with your phone next to your head that raises cortisol levels. We have 5G, which is military grade technology. Putting that next to your head all night, not so good for brain function and certainly not good for sleep. So make your room like a cave, dark, quiet, cool. Um, and then in terms of, so you'll notice everything I talk about is more lifestyle based first, because mm -hmm. if you don't conquer those the diet won't have as good of an effect. So, but certainly with diet, you want to um, think about really anti-inflammatory foods that are nutrient dense. So, um, you know, paleo diet, I wrote a whole book called Cave Women Don't Get Fat, which is a paleo diet book for women. So very protein rich, especially for breakfast. You've got to, if you're not intermittent fasting, right, you've got to really load up your neurotransmitters in the morning with lots of protein. This could be cold water, fatty fish. This could be um, a protein shake with two scoops of protein powder. It could be um, an omelet fortified with some ham or chicken or turkey. Uh, if you're dairy tolerant, you could have cottage cheese. That's actually a great source of protein. So any of those are protein rich options for breakfast, but you also wanna get protein throughout the day, lunch and dinner because a lot of my women, you know, as you're going into perimenopause and menopause, it can feel like PMS all month long where your appetite is up, you're hungry and you're craving like crazy. So protein helps stave off the cravings and the hunger a tremendous amount. And then of course, um, you really want to watch your sugars and have uh, 
complex, more complex carbs, so vegetables, wonderful, fruits, okay. Um, but you wanna have foods high in resistant starch that break down slowly. So heating, this is a great life hack. Heating and then cooling starches raises the resistant starch. That means it takes longer to break down in your bloodstream. So beans and legumes, uh, potatoes, potato salad that's mm -hmm. cold, just tossed with some olive oil and salt and herbs. Um, that's high in resistant starch. Sweet potatoes, also wonderful for hormone balancing, winter squashes, um, and then good quality fats like avocado, nuts and seeds, olive oil, coconut oil, those are butter. Those are all really good nutritious food. So if your diet is mostly comprised of real food, yeah. you're also gonna just have the energy and mental stamina to function and feel good and not be so bloated and sluggish. I, I love those recommendations because there it doesn't seem like you'd have to like uh, do anything magical. You don't need to have a five star chef. It's just it seems like being consistent, eating whole foods, and you know, getting out of the way of your own bullshit. Getting out of the way of your own bullshit. Yes, and also, um, you know, having a little patience with the process. If you feel like you're not losing weight eating a certain way, um, be open to trying a new way. Try just logging your food. Get a you know, My Fitness Pal or any free app out there. Yep. Log your food and say, all right, I tried a week eating this much protein and carbs. Mm, I didn't, I felt really tired in the afternoon. What can I change at the end of the day? Even if you're working with a nutrition professional or a functional medicine doctor, you're kind of on your own in terms of figuring out like where the fine tuning is. You know, I recommend, um, I'll customize an eating plan, but not everyone feels well on it. Then sometimes we have to tweak and adjust. I don't always hit it out of the gate. So you really, you know, you can partner with someone to help you and look at your log and say, oh, if you're tired, why don't you tweak this? But you still need to make the connection between mind and body. Like I had a client text me um, on Monday and she's like, oh, you know, she found these old supplements for mitochondrial support. She's like, can I take these? I'm just feeling really sluggish. I was like, what was your... What did you eat and what did you drink over the weekend? She's like, well, I drank too much booze. So I was like, this is great. This is part of the process. You know, she's very new to it. We've only had like one or two sessions together. So I said, this is part of the process. This is how you're going to learn, like, what destroys you and what supports you. I mean, listen, I'd be like a two night cocktail a night girl if I could. But the fact is, I'd be irritable and exhausted. and just overweight <laughs> and I have like no gut function after that. So I love alcohol, but alcohol doesn't love me. So the other no bullshit thing is kind of surrendering to like, that was the old me. Now this is the new me and not succumbing to social pressures around alcohol. Yeah. It's really intense. Like it's really intense. I was out to dinner recently and I ordered like I love grapefruit juice, a shy grapefruit juice in a, like a Pellegrino with some lime. It's really sour and tart and I really like it. And the waiter's like, don't you want some vodka? I was like, nope, because <laughs> I would have ordered it if I did, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, I'm good. So You look like you need it there, Esther. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was like, dudes. <laughs> I love it. I mean, often I'm the person not drinking and stuff and occasionally I do, but it's, it's not worth it. it messes with my sleep and I feel like garbage the next day. So what's the point? Absolutely. <laughs> so Esther, this is a question, uh, not only for you as a practitioner, but you as the accompanying gender here. Um, I want to be, <laughs> I want to be, and I want men to be a, uh, a partner and an ally in this perimenopausal and postmenopausal world for women. What can we 
better understand that allow us to be an ally in this because I know from my own personal experience with my mother and working with clients, et cetera, that I just don't understand everything that's going on because I'm a man. I don't necessarily go through the same things. And, you know, you see men in their seventies having their first kid, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not the same world. So I want to have a better understanding here so I can support and again, be a teammate here. So, so what do men need to know about perimenopausal and postmenopausal women? I have done a lot of podcasts, Sean. That is by far the most thoughtful and <laughs> considerate question I think I've ever heard, truly. Oh, wow, I, I really appreciate that. It's really, it's, I'm kind of blown away. Um, okay, uh, don't tell a woman to calm down. She's being irrational. <laughs> Wait a second. I've tried that so many times. I swear it's going to work one of these times. <laughs> oh yeah. My son tries that on me sometimes. I'm like, not so fast. Um, but yeah, you want to, um, I think just staying in the question of it all and be like, what can I do? Like, what can I do to make you feel better? What do you need? Okay. Because I think a lot of the symptoms, you have your physical symptoms from perimenopause and menopause, right? You get breast tenderness, you get like nipple soreness, like you get cramps, you get achy, you get all this weight gain and bloat. And a lot of women are like so ashamed of their bodies. Their libido drops. They don't feel sexy. They don't feel confident, like parading around naked. So you want to be very sensitive to that. Maybe lower the lights, light a candle or two, you know, soft lighting does magic. But um, um, I would also uh, bear in mind that this is a time in life when most women, if you have children and parents alive, uh, you are dealing with usually around this age, teenagers and aging parents. And- oh. So giving a woman space and permission to say no and set boundaries, I think is the most important thing, really being a partner and a best friend to your wife and really listening and being like, you know what, let's take things off your plate. Let's simplify. You know what? Maybe we don't cook every night. Maybe the, maybe I cook as the man, maybe I'll cook one or two meals a week or I'll do the shopping or, you know, balancing out the, uh, the tasks, helping out with the laundry, you know, it all is so appreciated or just saying we're going to go out or just order takeout one or two nights a week. You know, if you have the budget and can financially swing it, um, it makes a big, big, big difference. It really does. Or just say, you know what, you seem like you need some extra rest. I'll take the kids in the morning tomorrow. Just take a day, just take a day and stay in bed till 10 and uh, sometimes I think we just want the permission. We don't necessarily do it, but I think just listening and really that's not even perimenopause and menopause. That's just a healthy relationship of any kind. Well, I, I appreciate your, your honesty there. And I, I definitely am, trust me, I'm taking notes here because uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's tons of stuff that I can get from this because I think, you know, just to give you some insight in terms of, of the male mind is we still find, like I find my, my fiance attractive. She just had a baby and obviously she put on baby weight. I'm like, from the time she was nine months pregnant to now, I find her super attractive, mm. but that that's not the case in her mind. And whatever, she, you know, what my, my fiance believes is, is going to be what we believe kind of thing. Right. So that's one of the hardest parts as a, as a guy is, Oh, I thought I'm helping by telling you you're sexy, which again, probably does in some way, but probably also, um, layers on some shame of, of like, why don't I feel sexy? If my partner thinks I feel, uh, looks, looks mm. and, and cause you're the same to me, but you don't feel the same after having kids, after having to put your parents into a home, all these different things that are going on at once. It's just challenging for our, you know, imp caveman minds to deal with. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, you're very sensitive. I, I had never even thought that calling a woman sexy would have made her layered on additional shame. I, I think it, it, I am always telling my female patients, like, trust me, no man has ever complained about a woman's cellulite. It just doesn't happen. It's, we do it to ourselves. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think really partnering, being a friend, being a good listener and just saying, okay, you know, is it really, 
is she really unhappy about this? Or like, is there a bigger picture that we can, you know, how can we strategize? And men, listen, men do a great job at problem solving. So, <laughs> um, you know, the other great question is like, do you need me to listen or yeah. do you want me to strategize and partner with you on a solution? What do you need? I love that. I love that. Another good one. So Esther, we've talked about a lot today, and there's probably a lot of people that are interested in learning more, potentially working mm. with you. What are the best resources that you have available to either learn more or actually get to work with you? Yeah, thank you. Um, on Instagram, at gorgeous Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R. If you go to the link in my bio or you go to my website, estherblum.com, you and enter your email, you can download um, a three-part video training series I have on how to crush your cravings, but it's, it's really about how to optimize your nutrition. Uh, and then for five of your listeners, Sean, I have uh, a 30-minute consultation. I've opened up my schedule. Oh, very nice. You can, you can go to estherblum.com forward slash call. This is not a pick your brain session. This is a, I want help with these specific problems. And you and I hop on the phone and you leave with three customized strategies after 30 minutes of how to move the needle, whether it's weight loss, you need help with hormones, you need help with gut issues. Those are really the, my wheelhouse or autoimmune issues. Those are really what I see in practice the most. Esther Blum phoning in from Western Weston, Connecticut today. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and stay Thank safe. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you so much to Esther for coming on to today's podcast. And in the show notes and description below, I have linked all of her social media and website information. You're going to go there if you want to be entered into one of those five free assessments that she is offering. Again, if you want to stay up to date on the Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below, share it with a friend, go online, give us a review of five stars, and we will see you next time with a brand new episode of the Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity podcast.